I'm looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Last time we made it to verse 8. And it was all about how the Lord is more concerned with your spiritual diet and your spiritual exercise, not so much concerned with bodily exercise. He said in verse 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godliness is profitable unto all things. Bodily exercise doesn't matter so much. He talks about how... <clears throat> In verse 3, how these people are teaching these doctrines of devils, for, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. But it says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So the Lord isn't so much concerned with what you're eating. If you can give thanks for it, you can eat it. So he's not so much concerned with the food you're putting in. He's not so much concerned with the bodily exercise. He's concerned with your spiritual diet and your spiritual exercise. And we're going to pretty much keep going with that same theme. So he said, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You see, bodily exercise helps you in this life only. But exercising yourself to godliness, that's profitable in this life and in the life which is to come, your eternity. So he says in verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So it's a faithful saying. If it's faithful, then it's firm in adherence to the truth. This is a true saying. This is a faithful saying. And he says it's worthy of all acceptation. It, that means it's worthy of full acceptance. You can fully accept this as the truth. Just like you can with the rest of the Bible. You can fully accept it as the truth. And that's what I say to people who constantly... Give me a hard time on being a King James Bible believer. I say I can open the book, and no matter where I go, I can say this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. I can fully accept it. I don't have to wonder if this was a mistranslation. I don't have to wonder if I need to go to the Greek and change it and say a better rendering would be this. You know, I don't approach the Bible to correct it. I approach the Bible hoping that it's going to correct me and mold me and change me. I don't want to be critical approaching the Bible because it's faithful sayings that are, that are worthy of all acceptation. I can fully accept it. He says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So he said we both labor. We labor when, if you're doing right, if you're doing good Christian service, you're laboring. And see, that's exercising yourself rather unto godliness. You, when you labor and do Christian service, you end up doing bodily exercise. So just doing, exercising yourself rather unto godliness will lead you to enough bodily exercise. So you labor in the gospel, and that results in bodily exercise and is beneficial to your health. You suffer reproach. If someone reproaches you, they're upbraiding you, they're treating you with scorn and contempt. And you know what? When they do that, when they oppress you, this just adds thick skin and toughness even more than bodily exercise will. When you're going around laboring in the word and doctrine and the giving out the gospel, you're going to suffer reproach and you're going to get thick skin. You're going to be tougher than somebody that works out. It says, because we trust in the living God. 
We trust in the living God. All these other gods, they're either dead or going to die. But we got a, a Savior that died for us, and now he's alive forevermore. And we're going to be alive as long as he's alive, which is eternity. We trust in the living God. Everybody else is trusting in dead gods. And look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Revelation 1, 18. We trust in the living God. Jesus said in Revelation 1, 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So we trust in the living God. He's alive forevermore. We don't have to worry about him dying. He's not going to die again. The next time he comes, he's not going to be crucified. Now look, turn the page, look at Revelation 2.8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. That's Jesus Christ. He's the first and the last. He was dead, now he's alive. The fact that he rose again proves that he's God, and we trust in the living God. And then back to 1 Timothy, it says he's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So he's the Savior of all men. He is everyone's Savior. Even the ones that don't trust Him as Savior. He's still their Savior. Look at 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. You see, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world, even for the sins of the people who wouldn't believe on him to be their Savior. He died for all sins. So you know what that means is, these people that are lost, the only difference between you and this lost person next to you is that you accepted the payment that Jesus Christ paid, and they don't. He bought them too, but they're not accepting the payment. You accepted the payment. He's the Savior of all men. In 1 Timothy, Paul said, back there in verse 10, he said, Who is the Savior of all men? Every man you know, Jesus Christ is their Savior. But then he says, especially of those that believe. He's this lost guy's savior over here. But you accepted the payment. And it's specially of those that believe. See, he's your savior. He bought you. He paid your sin debt. But you have to accept the payment. If you don't accept the payment, you go to hell. It, and it's not like some people think. They think, some people think, well, Jesus just died for the people who are a certain, that God's elected certain people to be saved, elected certain people to be damned. No, he died for all, and he leaves it up to their free will choice to accept the payment or reject the payment. He's the Savior of all men, but especially of those that believe you have to believe you have and when the moment you believe that's accepting the payment and then you're saved so he's the savior of all men especially of those that believe then he says in first uh, timothy 4 11 these things command and teach so these things what things the things that we've looked at in this chapter the things about in the latter times people are going to depart from the faith Give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're going to be forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. They're going to be getting away from good doctrine. They're not going to be nourished up in the words of Jesus Christ and the words of faith. 
he's saying these things command to teach. He's commanding and teaching to refuse profane and old wise fables, but exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Don't worry so much about bodily exercise. Perhaps Timothy was getting out of Bible study a little bit and starting to worry about the bodily exercise and the health food stuff too much. But Paul's saying, remember, get back in the doctrine. You got to labor in the word and doctrine. So he's saying these things command. Now command, that's command. That ain't just suggest it and hint at it. It's command it. He wants him to get up and command these things. Command and teach. Which Timothy's supposed to be apt to teach according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 when he's given the qualifications for a pastor. He, one of those qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 2 is a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given the hospitality, apt to teach. So these things command and teach. That's where things are really going wrong. Nobody's teaching anymore. They want to say, you know, it's about all about preaching now. We need to teach it. Nobody knows nothing. Nobody knows the doctrine. Nobody's interested in the Bible. It's because you got to get them interested in the Bible. You got to get them into the meat. I know that they don't want meat. They don't. They just want to stay on milky stuff. They want to just listen to the music. They just want to hear fifty songs and cry and go home and all that. But you got to be get them into the meat. You got them into the doctrine. Just like your kids, you know, my kids, what does my son want to do? He wants to go to the pantry and get Little Debbie cakes and donuts and Hershey bars. He doesn't want no, my daughter doesn't want meat. My son doesn't want meat. He doesn't want good food. They just want the dessert. But you got to get the strong meat. And once you get the strong meat... And you start standing in the strong meat, that'll be what you want more than anything. Like, I don't really care too much about dessert anymore. I don't really care too much about ice cream anymore. The first thing I want is meat. If I go to a buffet, I fill my plate up with steak and chicken and all this stuff. I don't really so much care about that junk anymore, the, the dessert. I'd pick the steak and, and the meat over everything else. That's the way it is with the Bible. The more you get into it, the more meat you get. That's what you're going to want. And then you might want a little bit of the dessert at the end. He says, he says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. Verse 12, he said, Let no man despise thy youth. So, Timothy is a young man and... Paul's telling him, let no man despise thy youth. And they won't despise your youth if you lead by example. You got I got all these I work with. The people I work with are way older than me or a little bit younger than me. And the young guys, they come in there and they just act like idiots. And the older men despise them. They despise their youth. These guys, they won't lead by example. If they'd come in and act right and do what they're supposed to do, then they would earn, earn their respect by, from the older men. So he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. No matter where you go, whether it be at work, at church, wherever you're going, you need to be an example of the believers. Don't ruin your testimony. You need to be doing works that would match somebody that's professing to be a Christian. So, he says, That no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word. So be an example in what you say and preach. If you're going to be telling somebody to not cuss, there's a lot of people that I work with, they go around telling each other, quit cussing or clean your mouth up. A lot of older men there that are, are deacons or they claim to be a preacher or a pastor even. 
they'll be, I, I hear them a lot of times, they'll be getting on to the younger guys for cussing, but then they're cussing. Like the other day, this guy was saying, uh, A double S S H I T. Every now and then, I hear him tell a dirty joke, and then a young lost guy comes in and he says the F word, and they're getting all up, jumping all on him for saying the F word. And I'm thinking, you can't be telling him to quit saying the F word when you're saying all this stuff. You're not being an example of the believers in word. So, why would you expect a lost young kid? To come in there, be an example. To be an example in word. And if you're a young, if you're a young man, you need to be going in there, be an example of the believers as well in word, in what you say. Then it says in word, in conversation. Your conversation, that's how you behave. That's your manner of life. Let's look at some verses that says this word conversation. Philippians 1, 27. He says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. If it becomes it, it matches it. It, it meets it. It's a, uh, you, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let your conversation be, let it, let it match some, somebody who claims to be a Christian. Don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk, like they say. Let it match somebody. Let it match somebody that's preaching the gospel of Christ. They shouldn't hear you talk about church and the gospel in one breath and then you're saying a dirty joke or some sexual innuendo in another breath but that's how they all do you can't be saying that's junk at all you can't be cussing you can't be saying dirty jokes and you have to watch yourself and uh like the break room they're going to be in there saying dirty jokes and every now and then they're going to say something that's kind of dirty and it's kind of funny and you got to watch yourself because you might end up almost laughing about it. And that can ruin you as well. And that can be a hard thing when you're out, when you're at school, when you're at work. You have to be an example of the believers in word, in conversation. That's your manner of life, your conversation. Not just how you talk, but how you walk. And it says in charity. Your charity your, is your loving motive for the saints in everything that you do. And in spirit, he shouldn't have a naughty spirit. Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. You should, he shouldn't have a naughty spirit or a haughty spirit. He should be focused on the Spirit of God, yield himself to the Spirit of God, Let no man despise thy youth in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith. If he's, if he's not haughty in spirit, this is really going to go a long way with older men. Because what I've noticed with the really young men, you see, I'm not very young. I'm not very old yet. I'm kind of in the middle. And I, who I work with is men that are getting older. And I work with a lot of younger ones, and they're constantly fighting. The really young men, they want to get in fights with the older men. The, the older men get in fights with the young men. It's because the young men have a haughty spirit. They think they know everything. And they want to give you advice, and they've, been, they've not even been working or out of high school but a year or two. And they want to give these old men that's been there for 30 years, 30 and 40 years advice, and it just doesn't go over too well. And then the old men, they want to, they don't realize that they don't uh, have the strength that they used to have. And they think they can still outwork the young men. So they're supposed to be uh, at the age where they can give wisdom and advice. But instead of giving wisdom advice and advice, 
They're just constantly fighting and bickering with the young men. And it starts with the young men and their haughty spirit, thinking that they know so much, thinking that they're so much better, so much pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If you're approaching the older men like, like, like you think you just know it all and that they're stupid, they're going to despise your youth. Let no man despise thy youth in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith. They should see the word effectually working in you. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 I really love this verse. First Thessalonians 2.13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You're seeing the word. You, when you approach the word, people can tell you don't just see this as something that men wrote you take it so serious serious that it's the truth that it's the word of god this is something god wrote and it's going to effectually work in you in every aspect of your life because you believe that it's true you believe these are faithful sayings that are worthy of all acceptation you can tell the person who's a christian but he he thinks the Bible's got errors in it. They got a whole different outlook on everything compared to the guy that he, when he opens his Bible, he, see, he can look at it and say, this is right, that's right, this is right, that's right. And just in every agreement with everything that's on the page, he can open it and say, this is a faithful saying. This is worthy of all acceptation. And that's, they're not going to despise your youth. When you have faith and in the words and they're going to effectually work in you everywhere you go so let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity in spirit in faith in purity you got to be pure clean you're not going to work and saying one thing and then you're out getting not out getting drunk on friday night getting a DUI and everything else. You're going to make yourself just bring shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're give, going to give me an occasion to blaspheme. You can't be claiming to be a, some pastor one day and then you're out Friday just sowing your wild oats, as they say. You need to sow good things. You sow good things, you're going to reap good things. You sow these. You sow bad things, you're going to reap bad things. But Paul says in verse 13 of 1 Timothy 4, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So give attendance to reading. That means if you give attendance to it, you pay, pay attention to, regard, Make sure you read. Give attendance to reading. And what was Jesus Christ saying over and over again? Like in Matthew 12, 3, he said, But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? So have ye not read what David did? Have ye not read what Jonah did? Have ye not read what Elijah did? Have you not read what Abraham did? Have you not read what all these Old Testament characters did? What was it that Jesus always says, Have you not read? Have you not read in the Scriptures? He said in Matthew 12, 5, Or have you not read in the law? He said in Matthew 19, 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning male, made them male and female? Constantly saying that in 21, Matthew 21, 16, 21, 42, 22, 31, constantly saying, have you not read? Have you not read in the scriptures? Jesus Christ was a Bible reader. Colossians 4, 16. Colossians 4 and verse 16 says, And when this epistle is read among you, 
Cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. You need to be given attendance to reading. Before I was saved, you wouldn't catch me reading nothing. I didn't want to read anything. I'm, I, I still, I'm not a reader when it comes to like books that that aren't about the Bible. But I'll, pretty much all I do now is I want to read the Bible. I'm all the time getting Bible-believing books, and I want to read those. You got to give attendance to reading the Bible first and foremost. Read the Scriptures. This, this is exercise. You're getting your senses exercised when you read the scriptures. And it's much more profitable than bodily exercise. You need to be giving attendance to reading because, you see, you're constantly forgetting things. And if you're not going to replace the things that you're forgetting with new things, you're going to get dumber and dumber. Your IQ is going to get lower and lower. And don't you want to be able... When you go out into this world to work, to school, don't you want to be able to carry on a conversation about the Bible, about the Lord? You see, these these people, they got all, they got all these thoughts and ways of thinking, and they got all these thoughts about the Bible and Christianity, and they're going to be asking you questions, and you need to be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. You need to always be ready to give an answer. And since you neglect reading, you neglect ever learning the doctrine, the meat. And all, the, all Christians want to do now is hear singing and emotional songs and just cry and all this stuff. They're neglecting to getting into the scriptures. And so when these people ask them questions or about anything, they can't give them any answers. They can't give them any help because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Another verse about reading, 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 5.27 I charge you by the Lord Jesus that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. So you see, Paul was writing this to the Thessalonians, but he wanted it read unto all the holy brethren. When he was uh, writing it to the Colossians, he said, have those at Laodicea read this, and you read the one from Laodicea. You see, these Pauline epistles, that's our primary doctrine for us today. You need to be getting very familiar with the Pauline epistles, reading them. Now, we don't believe that it's just the Pauline epistles that are our doctrine for today. We can get doctrine out of all the Bible, but we filter it through the Pauline epistles. Nobody realizes that. Everybody thinks that what you really need to go by today is the words of Christ in red. Like, they think that, you know, if you mention that Paul is our primary doctrine, they say, well, what about Jesus? What about the Gospels? But they don't realize that what Paul wrote, he got all this knowledge, he got it by the revelation of Jesus Christ, as he talks about in the book of Galatians. What Jesus Christ said back there in the Gospels and read, that's, that's not the only thing Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ wrote the whole Bible. And pro the primary doctrine for you today is the Pauline epistles. And he's, he says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. You, you need to be getting into these Pauline epistles, getting familiar with them, and reading them. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Exhortation, that's words intended to incite and encourage. You don't hear much uh, exhortation going on. Most of what you hear going on between people is words that discourage. You, you don't hear much words building each other up. You hear words tearing each other down. And I know a lot of it's teasing and 
all people want to do is tease and tear each other down and laugh and carry on. But you need to be exhorting one another, building one another up, growing up, putting away these childish things, these childish words and conversation, just always joking around constantly. It really gets old to me after a while. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. That's the first reason why we need the scriptures is for doctrine. Second Timothy 3 15 it says and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus and then he says all scripture in verse 16 he says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So first and foremost, the scriptures are profitable for doctrine. And nobody knows the doctrine today because they're not giving themselves attendance to reading. They don't care about the doctrine. The doctrine's been put on the shelf. Nobody knows the basic doctrine. Nobody knows the, the deeper things of the word of God or the strong meat. So therefore, they can't help anybody when it comes to the scriptures. So Paul tells Timothy, don't be worried so much about the health food. Don't be worried so much about the bodily exercise. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. This is what you need to be doing, these spiritual exercises. Bodily exercise profits a little. You need to have your senses exercised. He says in verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So he says, and Neglect not the gift. If he, if he gets caught up in the bodily exercise stuff, if he gets too caught up in the health food stuff, which aren't bad things, he, he could start neglecting his gift. If he gets caught up in the old wise fables that he was talking about back there earlier in the chapter, he's going to start neglecting the gift. If he gets caught up in the commandments of men and the tradition of men, he's going to start neglecting the gift. He's, if he gets caught up in those doctrines of devils, then he's not going to be able to exercise his gift. So neglect not the gift that is in thee. You know, the Lord's gave you a gift. Maybe your gift, your gift is teaching the Word of God or answering people's questions about the Word of God. Keep exercising that gift. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Keep doing it. Keep using it. Keep exercising it. He says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So, Timothy was given a gift by the laying on the hands of Paul. And Paul, this could be a different scenario than what we've got today because you remember Paul had the signs of an apostle. And when he laid hands on Timothy at his ordina ordination, he, Timothy, it looks like Timothy got a gift there. Because Paul had the signs of an apostle, which we don't have today. To be an apostle, you had to be around to see Jesus Christ in his resurrected body. And Paul did sit, saw him on the road to Damascus. So neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The presbytery is a, a body of elders in the church. And it says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that the pro thy profiting may appear to all. So you see, Timothy, he's a young man, and he's a good man. And he's somebody that the, the elders in the church thought enough of to lay hands on. And he's got this gift, and Paul doesn't want him to, to neglect it. 
He doesn't want him to get off into this bodily exercise too much, into this health food stuff too much, into these doctrines of devils and commandments of men. He wants him to give attendance to reading, command and teach these things, and neglect not the gift that he's, was, was given to him at his ordination. And he wants him to meditate upon these things, all these things that he spoke of in this chapter. Meditate on it. Give himself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. If he, if he meditates on them, gives himself wholly to them, then the older men aren't going to despise his youth. They're going to see it effectually working in him. So meditate upon these things. In Joshua 1, eight, Joshua 1 and verse 8, it says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Nobody's going to despise your youth. Nowhere near as much if you're meditating on these things that Paul's saying. Meditate upon these things. Look at Psalm 1 and verse 2. Psalm 1 and verse 2. Start in verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Constantly meditating in the word. So meditate. And there's a lot of good verses about meditating. Psalm 63, 6. Psalm 77, 12. Psalm 119, 15. Psalm 119, 48. Psalm 119, 78. Psalm 119, 148. Psalm 143, 5. 119, 97. 119, 99. Meditate. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. If you give yourself wholly to it, you're giving yourself entirely to it, completely to it. Make the Bible your hobby. Make the Bible not just your duty, but your hobby, the thing that you want to do. That your profiting may appear to all. Your improvement, your gain, your progress. The more you get in the Word, the more you're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that you're profiting, it's going to appear to all. They're going to see a change in you. You want to be constantly growing, constantly changing with each passing week. Now verse 16, he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So take heed unto thyself. A minister needs to faithfully keep himself in check, watching his spiritual diet so that he doesn't wreck himself and get into a shipwreck. Like that's what happened back there in 1 Timothy 1.19. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They've made shipwreck of the faith in themselves by not taking heed unto themselves and keeping their spiritual diet in check, keeping their doctrine in check. And when a pastor doesn't keep him to take heed unto himself, make sure he's putting the right doctrine in, putting the right things in, he's going to shipwreck. He's going to lead others in this shipwreck. And it's like the blind leading the blind. And if he's, if he's not taking heed unto himself... It's not just about him anymore. He's got the responsibility of all these people that's looking to him for doctrine. And see, if he, if he takes it into himself and unto the doctrine and continues in the right doctrine, then he's going to save himself and those that hear him. And that doesn't mean, save, that doesn't mean Timothy's going to save himself from hell. He's already been saved from hell. He's already a son in the faith. According to Paul, he's already saved. So this this isn't talking about salvation from hell. It's being saved from deception and a, a spiritual shipwreck. 
and he if he if he shipwrecks he's going to take all these people down with him so he says for in, in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee so every time the bible says saved or or the word save it doesn't always mean salvation from hell just like that verse where it talks about the woman in first uh, timothy 2 where she's saved and childbearing that's that's not talking about salvation from hell like in first uh, timothy 2 15 it says notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety that's not talking about you know a woman has to be bearing a child to be saved that verse was talking about being saved from deception kind of the way it is here if 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 timothy takes heed to himself keeps himself in check and keeps the right doctrine and continues in that right doctrine he's going to save himself he's going to save himself from deception and those that are under him listening to him they're going to be saved from deception as well and how's he going to be safe from this deception? Well, he's got to give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in him. Keep his mind on the words of the Holy Bible and not getting off into these doctrines of devils, getting off into these commandments of men, these old wise fables not getting too far off into the bodily exercise, but giving attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So that's the end of 1 Timothy chapter 4.